Part 2, Chapter 1 of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. Part 2, Chapter 1. 1. I pass over an interval of almost two months. The reader need not be uneasy. Everything will be clear from the latter part of my story. I start again from the 15th of November, a day I remember only too well for many reasons. To begin with, no one who had known me two months before would have recognized me, externally anyway. That is to say, anyone would have known me, but would not have been able to make me out. To begin with, I was dressed like a dandy. The conscientious and tasteful Frenchman whom Versilov had once tried to recommend me had not only made me a whole suit, but had already been rejected as not good enough. I already had suits made by other superior tailors of a better class, and I even ran up bills with them. I had an account, too, at a celebrated restaurant, but I was still a little nervous there and paid on the spot whenever I had money, though I knew it was mauvais ton, and that I was compromising myself by doing so. A French barber on the Nevsky Prospect was on familiar terms with me, and told me anecdotes as he dressed my hair, and I must confess I practiced my French on him, Though I know French, and fairly well indeed, yet I'm afraid of beginning to speak it in grand society, and I dare say my accent is far from Parisian. I have a smart coachman, Matvi, with a smart turnout, and he is always at my service when I send for him. He has a pale sorrel horse, a fast trotter, I don't like greys. Everything is not perfect, however. It's the 15th of November and has been wintry weather for the last three days, and my fur coat is an old one, lined with raccoon, that once was Versilov's. It wouldn't fetch more than 25 rubles. I must get a new one, and my pocket is empty, and I must, besides, have money in reserve for this evening, whatever happens. Without that, I shall be ruined and miserable. That was how I put it to myself at the time. Oh, degradation where had these thousands come from these fast trotters these expensive restaurants how could i all at once change like this and forget everything shame reader i am beginning now the story of my shame and disgrace and nothing in life can be more shameful to me than these recollections I speak as a judge, and I know that I was guilty, even in the world in which I was caught up, and though I was alone without a guide or counselor, I was, I swear, conscious of my downfall. And so there's no excuse for me. And yet for those two months I was almost happy. Why, almost? I was quite happy. And so happy! Would it be believed that the consciousness of my degradation, of which I had glimpses at moments, frequent moments, and which made me shudder in my inmost soul, only intoxicated me the more. What do I care if I'm fallen? And I won't fall. I'll get out of it. I have a lucky star. I was crossing a precipice on a thin plank without a rail, and I was pleased at my position and even peeped into the abyss. It was risky, and it was delightful. And my idea, my idea later, the idea would wait. Everything that happened was simply a temporary deviation. Why not enjoy oneself? That's what was amiss with my idea. I repeat, it admitted of all sorts of deviations. If it had not been so firm and fundamental, I might have been afraid of deviating. And meanwhile, I kept on the same humble lodging. I kept it on, but I didn't live in it. There I kept my trunk, my bag, and my various properties. But I really lived with Prince Sergei. I spent my days there, and I slept there at night, and this went on for weeks. How this came to pass, I'll tell in a minute, but meanwhile I will describe my little lodging. It was already dear to me. Versilov had come to see me there of himself, first of all after our quarrel, and often subsequently. I repeat, this was a period of shame, but of great happiness. Yes, and everything at that time was so successful and so smiling. And what was all that depression in the past about, I wondered in some ecstatic moments. Why those old painful self-lacerations, my solitary and gloomy childhood, my foolish dreams under my quilt, my vows, my calculations, even my idea. I imagined and invented all that, and it turns out that the world's not like that at all. See how happy and gay I am. I have a father, Versilov. I have a friend, Prince Sergei. I have, besides, 
but that besides will leave. Alas, it was all done in the name of love, magnanimity, honor, and afterwards it turned out hideous, shameless, and ignominious enough. Two, he came to see me for the first time three days after our rupture. I was not at home, and he waited for me. Though I had been expecting him every day, when I went into my tiny cupboard of a room, there was a mist before my eyes, and my heart beat so violently that I stopped short in the doorway. Fortunately, my landlord was with him, having thought it necessary to introduce himself at once, that the visitor might not be bored with waiting. He was eagerly describing something to Versilov. He was a titular counselor, a man about forty, much disfigured by smallpox, very poor and burdened with a consumptive wife and an invalid child. He was of a very communicative and unassuming character, but not without tact. I was relieved at his presence, which was a positive deliverance for me. For what could I have said to Versilov? I had known, known in earnest, that Versilov would come of his own prompting, exactly as I wanted him to. For nothing in the world would have induced me to go to him first, and not from obstinacy, but just from love of him, a sort of jealous love. I can't express it. Indeed, the reader won't find me eloquent at any time. But though I had been expecting him for those three days, and had been continually picturing how he would come in, yet though I tried my utmost, I could not imagine what we should say to one another at first, after all that had happened. Ah, here you are, he said to me affectionately, holding out his hand and not getting up. Sit down with us. Pyotr Politovich is telling me something very interesting about that stone near the Pavlovsky barracks, or something in that direction. Yes, I know the stone, I made haste to answer, dropping into a chair beside him. They were sitting at the table. The whole room was just fourteen feet square. I drew a deep breath. There was a gleam of pleasure in Versilov's eyes. I believe he was uncertain and afraid I should be demonstrative. He was reassured. You must begin again, Pyotr Ipolitovich. They were already calling each other by their names. It happened in the reign of the late Tsar, Pyotr Pilitovich said, addressing me nervously and with some uneasiness, anxious as to the effect of his story. You know that stone, a stupid stone in the street, and what use is it? It's only in the way, you'd say, wouldn't you? The Tsar rode by several times, and every time there was the stone. At last the Tsar was displeased, and with good reason, a rock, a regular rock, standing in the street, spoiling it. Remove the stone! Well, he said, remove it. You understand what that means. Remove the stone. The late Tsar, do you remember him? What was to be done with the stone? They all lost their heads. There was the town council, and a most important person, I can't remember his name, one of the greatest personages of the time, who was put in charge of the matter. Well, this great personage listened. They told him it would cost 15,000 rubles, no less, and in silver, too. For it was not till the time of the late Tsar that paper money could be changed into silver. Fifteen thousand! What a sum! At first the English wanted to bring rails and remove it by steam, but think what that would have cost. There were no railways then. There was only one running to Sarske Selo. Why, they might have smashed it up, I cried, frowning. I felt horribly vexed and ashamed in Versilov's presence. But he was listening with evident pleasure. I understood that he was glad to have the landlord there, as he, too, was abashed with me. I saw that. I remember I felt it somehow touching in him. Smash it up. Yes, that was the very idea they arrived at. In Montferrand, too, he was building St. Isaac's Cathedral at the time. Smash it up, he said, and then take it away. But what would that cost? It would cost nothing. Simply break it up and carry it away. No, excuse me. A machine would be wanted to do it. A steam engine. And besides, where could it be taken? In such a mountain, too. Ten thousand, they said. Not less than ten or twelve thousand. I say, Pyotr Ipolitovich, that's nonsense, you know. It couldn't have been so. But at that instant, Versilov winked at me, unseen, and in that wink I saw such delicate compassion for the landlord, even distress on his account, that I was delighted with it, and I laughed. 
"'Well, well, then,' cried the landlord, delighted. He had noticed nothing and was awfully afraid, as such storytellers always are, that he would be pestered with questions. "'But then a Russian workman walks up, a young fellow, you know, the typical Russian, with a beard like a wedge, in a long-skirted coat, and perhaps a little drunk, too. But no, he wasn't drunk. He just stands by while those Englishmen and Montferrant are talking away, and that great personage drives up just then in his carriage and listens and gets angry at the way they keep discussing it and can't decide on anything. And suddenly he notices the workman at a distance standing there and smiling deceitfully. That is, not deceitfully, though. I'm wrong there. What is it? Derisively, Verslav prompted him discreetly, derisively yes a little derisively that kind good russian smile you know the great personage was in a bad humor you understand what are you waiting here for big beard said he who are you why i'm looking at this stone here your highness says he yes i believe he said highness and i fancy it was prince Savorov, the italian one the ancestor of the general, but no, it was not Savorov, and I'm sorry I've forgotten who it was exactly, but though he was a highness, he was a genuine thoroughbred Russian, a Russian type, a patriot, a cultured Russian heart. Well, he saw what was up. What is it? says he. Do you want to take away the stone? What are you sniggering about? At the Englishman, chiefly, your highness. They ask a prodigious price because the Russian purse is fat and they've nothing to eat at home. Let me have a hundred rubles, your highness, says he. By tomorrow evening, we'll move the stone. Can you imagine such a proposition? The English, of course, are ready to devour him. Montferrant laughs. But that highness, with the pure Russian heart, says, Give him a hundred rubles. But surely you won't remove it, says he. Tomorrow evening, your highness, we'll have it on the move, says he. But how will you do it? If you'll excuse me, your highness, that's our secret, he says, and in that Russian way, you know, it pleased him. Hey, give him anything he wants. And so they left it. What would you suppose he did? The landlord paused and looked from one to the other with a face full of sentiment. I don't know, said Verslav, smiling. I scowled. Well, I'll tell you what he did, said the landlord with as much triumph as though it were his own achievement. He hired some peasants with spades, simple Russians, and began digging a deep hole just at the edge of it. They were digging all night. They dug an immense hole as big as the stone and just about an inch and a half deeper. And when they dug it out, he told them to dig out the earth from under the stone, cautiously, little by little. Well... Naturally, as they dug the earth away, the stone had nothing to stand upon. It began to overbalance, and as soon as it began to shake, they pushed with their hands upon the stone, shouting, Hurrah! in true Russian style, and the stone fell with a crash into the hole. Then they shoveled earth on it, rammed it down with a mallet, paved it over with little stones. The road was smooth, the stone had disappeared. Only fancy, cried Verslav. The people rushed up to be sure, in multitudes innumerable. The Englishmen had seen how it would be long before. They were furious. Montfront came up. That's the peasant style, says he. It's too simple, says he. That's just it, that it's so simple. But you never thought of it, you fools. And so I tell you, that commander, that great personage, simply embraced him and kissed him. And where do you come from, says he. From the province of Yaroslav, your excellency, we're tailors by trade, and we come to Petersburg in the summer to sell fruit. Well, it came to the ears of the authorities. The authorities ordered a medal to be given him, so he went about with a medal on his neck, but he drank himself to death afterwards, they say. You know the typical Russian. He has no self-restraint. That's why the foreigners have got the better of us so far. Yes, there it is. Yes, of course, the Russian mind, Verslav was beginning. But at this point, luckily, the landlord was called away by his invalid wife and hastened off, or I should have been unable to restrain myself. Verslav laughed. He's been entertaining me for a whole hour, my dear. That stone, 
is the very model of patriotic unseemliness among such stories. But how could I interrupt him? As you saw, he was melting with delight, and what's more, I believe the stone's there still, if I'm not mistaken, and hasn't been buried in the hole at all. Good heavens, yes, I cried, that's true. How could he dare? What's the matter? Why, I believe you're really indignant. He certainly has muddled things up. I heard a story of the sword about a stone when I was a child, only of course it was a little different, and not about the same stone. <laughs> that it came to the ears of the authorities. Why, there was a paean of glory in his heart when he uttered that phrase, it came to the ears of the authorities. In the pitiful narrowness of their lives, they can't get on without such stories. They have numbers of them, chiefly owing to their incontinence. They've learnt nothing, they know nothing exactly, and they have a longing to talk about something besides cards and their wares, something of universal interest, something poetic. What sort of man is this Pyotr Ipolitovich? A very poor creature, and unfortunate too. Well, there you see. Perhaps he doesn't even play cards. I repeat in telling that foolish story he was satisfying his love for his neighbor. You see, he wanted to make us happy. His sentiment of patriotism was gratified too. They've got another story. For instance, that the English gave Zavyolov a million on condition that he shouldn't put his stamp on his handiwork. Oh, goodness, I've heard that story too. Who hasn't heard it? And the teller of it knows too that you have heard it. But still he tells it intentionally, supposing that you haven't. The vision of the Swedish king, I believe, is a little out of date with them now, but in my youth it used to be repeated unctuously in a mysterious whisper. And so was the story of someone's having knelt in the Senate before the senators at the beginning of last century. There were lots of anecdotes about Commander Bashutsky, too, how he carried away a monument. They simply love anecdotes of the court. For instance, tales of Chernyshev, a minister in the last reign, how when he was an old man of seventy, he got himself up to look like a man of thirty, so much so that the late Tsar was amazed at the levies. I've heard that too. Who hasn't heard it? All these anecdotes are the height of indecency. But let me tell you, this kind of indecency is far more deeply rooted and widely spread than we imagine. The desire to lie with the object of giving pleasure to your neighbor one meets even in Russian society of the highest breeding. For we all suffer from this incontinence of our hearts. Only anecdotes of a different type are current among us. The number of stories they tell about America is simply amazing, and they're told by men even of ministerial rank. I must confess, I belong to that indecent class myself and I've suffered from it all my life. I've told anecdotes about Chernyshev several times myself. You've told them yourself? There's another lodger here besides me, marked with smallpox, too. An old clerk, but he's awfully prosaic, and as soon as Pyotr Politovich begins to speak, he tries to refute him and contradict. He's reduced Pyotr Ipolitovich to such a point that he waits on the old fellow like a slave and does everything to please him, simply to make him listen. That's another type of the indecent, one even perhaps more revolting than the first. The first sort is all ecstasy. You only let me lie, he seems to say. You'll see how nice it will be. The second sort is all spleen and prose. I won't let you lie, he says. Where, when, in what year? In fact, a man with no heart. My dear boy, we must always let a man lie a little. It's quite innocent. Indeed, we may let him lie a great deal. In the first place, it will show our delicacy, and secondly, people will let us lie in return. Two immense advantages at once. Que diable! One must love one's neighbor. But it's time for me to be off. You've arranged the place charmingly, he added, getting up from his chair. I'll tell Sofia Andreevna and your sister that I've been here and found you quite well. Goodbye, my dear. Could this be all? This was not at all what I wanted. I was expecting something different, something important, though I quite understood that this was how it must be. 
I got up with a candle to light him down the stairs. The landlord would have come forward, but without Verslav seeing it, I seized him by the arm and thrust him back savagely. He stared with astonishment, but immediately vanished. These staircases, Verslav mumbled, dwelling on the syllables, evidently in order to say something, and evidently afraid I might say something. I'm no longer used to such stairs, and you're on the third story, but now I can find the way. Don't trouble, my dear. You'll catch cold, too. But I did not leave him. We were going down the second flight. I've been expecting you for the last three days, broke from me suddenly, as it were of itself. I was breathless. Thank you, my dear. I knew you'd be sure to come. And I knew that you knew I should be sure to come. Thank you, my dear. He was silent. We had reached the outer door, and I still followed him. He opened the door. The wind rushing in blew out my candle. Then I clutched his hand. It was pitch dark. He started but said nothing. I stooped over his hand and kissed it greedily several times, many times. My darling boy, why do you love me so much? he said, but in quite a different voice. His voice quivered. There was a ring of something quite new in it, as though it were not he who spoke. I tried to answer something but couldn't, and ran upstairs. He stood waiting where he was, and it was only when I was back in the flat that I heard the front door open and shut with a slam. I slipped by the landlord, who turned up again, and went into my room, fastened the latch, and without lighting the candle, threw myself on my bed, buried my face in the pillow, and cried and cried. It was the first time I had cried since I was at Touchard's. My sobs were so violent, and I was so happy. But why describe it? I write this now without being ashamed of it, for perhaps it was all good, in spite of its absurdity. 3. But didn't I make him suffer for it? I became frightfully overbearing. There was no reference to this scene between us afterwards. On the contrary, we met three days later as though nothing had happened. What's more, I was almost rude that evening, and he too seemed rather dry. This happened in my room again. For some reason I had not been to see him in spite of my longing to see my mother. We talked all this time, that is, throughout these two months, only of the most abstract subjects, and I can't help wondering at it. We did nothing but talk of abstract subjects, of the greatest interest, and of vast significance for humanity, of course, but with no bearing whatever on the practical position. Yet many, many aspects of the practical position needed, and urgently needed, defining and clearing up. But of that we did not speak. I did not even say anything about my mother, or Liza, or, or indeed about myself and my whole history. Whether this was due to shame or to youthful stupidity, I don't know. I expect it was stupidity, for shame I could have overcome. But I domineered over him frightfully, and absolutely went so far as insolence more than once, even against my own feelings. This all seemed to happen of itself, inevitably. I couldn't restrain myself. His tone was, as before, one of light mockery, though always extremely affectionate in spite of everything. I was struck, too, by the fact that he preferred coming to me, so that at last I very rarely went to see my mother, not more than once a week, especially towards the latter part of the time, as I became more and more absorbed in frivolity. He used always to come in the evenings to sit and chat with me. He was very fond of talking to the landlord, too, which enraged me in a man like him. The idea struck me that he might have nowhere to go except to see me, but I knew for a fact that he had acquaintances, and that he had indeed of late renewed many of his old ties in society, which he had dropped the year before. But he did not seem to be particularly fascinated by them, and seemed to have renewed many of them simply in a formal way. He preferred coming to see me. I was sometimes awfully touched by the timid way in which he almost always opened my door, and for the first minute looked with strange anxiety into my eyes. Am I in the way? he seemed to ask. Tell me, and I'll go. He even said as much sometimes. 
Once, for instance, towards the end, he came in when I had just put on a suit, brand new from the tailors, and was just setting off to Prince Sergei's to go off somewhere with him, where, I will explain later. He sat down without noticing that I was on the point of going out. He showed at moments a remarkable absence of mind. As luck would have it, he began to talk of the landlord. I fired up. Oh, damn the landlord! Ah, my dear, he said, getting up. I believe you're going out and I'm hindering you. Forgive me, please. And he meekly hastened to depart. Such meekness towards me from a man like him, a man so aristocratic and independent, who had so much individuality at once stirred in my heart all my tenderness for him and trust in him. But if he loved me so much, why did he not check me at the time of my degradation? If he had said one word, I should perhaps have pulled up though perhaps I should not. But he did see my foppery, my flaunting swagger, my smart matvi. I wanted once to drive him back in my sledge, but he would not consent, and indeed it happened several times that he refused to be driven in it. He could see I was squandering money, and he said not a word, not a word. He showed no curiosity even. I'm surprised at that to this day, even now. And yet I didn't stand on ceremony with him, and spoke openly about everything, though I never gave him a word of explanation. He didn't ask, and I didn't speak. Yet on two or three occasions we did speak on the money question. I asked him on one occasion, soon after he renounced the fortune he had won, how he was going to live now. Somehow, my dear, he answered with extraordinary composure, I know now that more than half of Tatiana Pavlovna's little capital of 5,000 rubles had been spent on Versilov during the last two years. Another time, it somehow happened that we talked of my mother. My dear boy, he said mournfully, I used often to say to Sofia Andreevna at the beginning of our life together, though indeed I've said it in the middle and at the end too, my dear, I worry you and torment you and I don't regret it as long as you're before me. But if you were to die, I know I should kill myself to atone for it. I remember, however, that he was particularly open that evening. If only I were a weak-willed non-entity and suffered from the consciousness of it. But you see, that's not so. I know I'm exceedingly strong. And in what way do you suppose? Why, just in that spontaneous power of accommodating myself to anything whatever, so characteristic of all intelligent Russians of our generation. There's no crushing me, no destroying me, no surprising me. I've as many lives as a cat. I can, with perfect convenience, experience two opposite feelings at one and the same time, and not, of course, through my own will. I know, nevertheless, that it's dishonorable just because it's so sensible. I've lived almost to fifty, and to this day, I don't know whether it's a good thing. I've gone on living or not. I like life, but that follows as a matter of course. But for a man like me to love life is contemptible. Of late, there has been a new movement, and the crafts won't accommodate themselves to things and shoot themselves. But it's evident that the crafts are stupid. We, to be sure, are clever, so that one can draw no parallel, and the question remains open anyway. And can it be that the earth is only for such as we? In all probability it is, but the idea is a comfortless one. However, however the question remains open anyway. He spoke mournfully, and yet I didn't know whether he was sincere or not. He always had a manner which nothing would have made him drop. 4. Then I besieged him with questions. I fell upon him like a starving man on bread. He always answered me readily and straightforwardly, but in the end always went off into the whitest generalizations, so that in reality one could draw no conclusions from it. And yet these questions had worried me all my life, and I frankly confess that even in Moscow I had put off settling them till I should meet him in Petersburg. I told him this plainly, and he did not laugh at me. On the contrary, I remember he pressed my hand. On general politics and social questions, I could get nothing out of him, and yet in connection with my idea, 
those subjects troubled me more than anything. Of men like Durgachev, I once drew from him the remark that they were below all criticism. But at the same time, he added strangely that he reserved the right of attaching no significance to his opinions. For a very long time, he would say nothing on the question how the modern state would end and how the social community would be built up anew. But in the end, I literally wrenched a few words out of him. I imagine that all will come about in a very commonplace way, he said once. Simply un bon matin, in spite of all the balance sheets on budget days and the absence of deficits, all the states without exception will be unable to pay so that they'll all be landed in general bankruptcy. Then, of course, there will follow a general liquidation, so to speak. The Jews will come to the fore, and the reign of the Jews will begin, and then all those who have never had shares in anything, and in fact never had anything at all, that is, all the beggars, will naturally be unwilling to take part in the liquidation. A struggle will begin, and after seventy-seven battles, the beggars will destroy the shareholders and carry off their shares and take their places as shareholders, of course. Perhaps they'll say something new, too, and perhaps they won't. Most likely they'll go bankrupt, too. Further than that, my dear boy, I can't undertake to predict the destinies by which the face of this world will be changed. Look in the apocalypse, though. But can it all be so materialistic? Can the modern world come to an end simply through finance? Oh, of course. I've only chosen one aspect of the picture, but that aspect is bound up with the whole by indissoluble bonds, so to speak. What's to be done? Oh, dear, don't be in a hurry. It's not all coming so soon. In any case, to do nothing is always best. One's conscience is at rest anyway, knowing that one's had no share in anything. I do stop that. Talk sense. I want to know what I'm to do and how I'm to live. What you are to do, my dear? Be honest. Never lie. Don't covet your neighbor's house. In fact, read the Ten Commandments. It's written there once for all. Don't talk like that. All that's so old. And besides, it's all words. I want something real. Well, if you're fearfully devoured by ennui, try to love someone or something or at any rate, to attach yourself to something. You're only laughing. Besides, what can I do alone with your Ten Commandments? Well, keep them in spite of all your doubts and questions, and you'll be a great man. Whom no one will know of. There is nothing hidden that shall not be made manifest. You're certainly laughing. Well, if you take it so to heart, you'd better try as soon as possible to specialize, take up architecture or the law, and then when you're busy with serious work, you'll be more settled in your mind and forget trifles. I was silent. What could I gather from this? And yet, after every such conversation, I was more troubled than before. Moreover, I saw clearly that there always remained in him, as it were, something secret, and that drew me to him more and more. Listen, I said, interrupting him one day. I always suspect that you say all this only out of bitterness and suffering, but that secretly you are a fanatic over some idea and are only concealing it or ashamed to admit it. Thank you, my dear. Listen, nothing's better than being useful. Tell me how, at the present moment, I can be most of use. I know it's not for you to decide that, but I'm only asking for your opinion. You tell me, and what you say, I swear I'll do. Well, what is the great thought? Well, to turn stones into bread. That's a great thought. The greatest? Yes, really, you have suggested quite a new path. Tell me, is it the greatest? It's very great, my dear boy, very great, but it's not the greatest. It's great, but secondary, and only great at the present time. Man will be satisfied and forget. He will say, I've eaten it, and what am I to do now? The question will remain open for all time. You spoke once of the Geneva Ideas. I didn't understand what you meant by the Geneva Ideas. 
The Geneva idea is the idea of virtue without Christ, my boy. The modern idea, or more correctly, the ideas of all modern civilization. In fact, it's one of those long stories which it's very dull to begin, and it will be a great deal better if we talk of other things, and better still if we're silent about other things. You always want to be silent. My dear, remember that to be silent is good, safe, and picturesque. Picturesque? Of course, silence is always picturesque, and the man who is silent always looks nicer than the man who is speaking. Why, talking as we do is no better than being silent. Damn such picturesqueness, and still more, damn such profitableness. My dear, he said suddenly, rather changing his tone, speaking with real feeling, and even with a certain insistence. I don't want to seduce you from your ideals to any sort of bourgeois virtue. I'm not assuring you that happiness is better than heroism. On the contrary, heroism is finer than any happiness, and the very capacity for it alone constitutes happiness. That's a settled thing between us. I respect you just for being able in these mawkish days to set up some sort of an idea in your soul. Don't be uneasy. I remember perfectly well. But yet one must think of proportion, for now you want to live a resounding life, to set fire to something, to smash something, to rise above everything in Russia, to call up storm clouds, to throw everyone into terror and ecstasy while you vanish yourself in North America. I've no doubt you've something of that sort in your heart, and so I feel it necessary to warn you, for I really love you, my dear. What could I gather from that either? There was nothing in it but anxiety for me, for my material prosperity. It betrayed the father with the father's kindly but prosaic feelings. Was this what I wanted by way of an idea for the sake of which any honest father would send his son to face death? as the ancient Roman Horatius sent his sons for the idea of Rome. I often pressed him on the subject of religion, but there the fog was thicker than ever. When I asked him what to do about that, he answered in the stupidest way, as though to a child. You must have faith in God, my dear. But what if I don't believe in all that? I cried irritably once. A very good thing, my dear. How a good thing! It's a most excellent symptom, dear boy, a most hopeful one for our atheists in Russia, if only they are really atheists and have some little trace of intelligence, are the best fellows in the whole world, and always disposed to be kind to God, for they are invariably good-humored, and they are good-humored because they are immensely pleased at being atheists. Our atheists are respectable people and extremely conscientious, pillars of the fatherland, in fact. This was something, of course, but it was not what I wanted. On one occasion, however, he spoke out, but so strangely that he surprised me more than ever, especially after the stories of Catholicism and penitential chains that I had heard about him. Dear boy, he said one day, not in my room but in the street when I was seeing him home after a long conversation, to love people as they are is impossible, and yet we must, and therefore do them good, overcoming your feelings, holding your nose, and shutting your eyes, the latter's essential. Endure evil from them as far as may be without anger, mindful that you too are a man. Of course, you'll be disposed to be severe with them if it has been vouchsafed to you to be ever so little more intelligent than the average. Men are naturally base and like to love from fear. Don't give in to such love, and never cease to despise it. Somewhere in the Quran, Allah bids the Prophet look upon the froward as upon mice. Do them good, and pass them by. A little haughty, but right. Know how to despise them even when they are good, for most often it is in that that they are base. Oh, my dear, it's judging by myself I say that. Anyone who's not quite stupid can't live without despising himself. Whether he's honest or dishonest, it makes no difference. To love one's neighbor and not despise him is impossible. I believe that man has been created physically incapable of loving his neighbor. 
There has been some mistake in language here from the very first, and love for humanity must be understood as love for that humanity which you have yourself created in your soul. In other words, you have created yourself, and your love is for yourself, and which, therefore, never will be in reality. Never will be? My dear boy, I agree that if this were true, it would be stupid, but that's not my fault, and I was not consulted at the creation. I reserve the right to have my own opinion about it. How is it they call you a Christian, then? I cried. A monk in chains, a preacher. I don't understand it. Why, who calls me that? I told him. He listened very attentively, but cut short the conversation. I can't remember what led to this memorable conversation, but he was positively irritated, which scarcely ever happened to him. He spoke passionately and without irony, as though he were not speaking to me. But again, I didn't believe him. He could not speak on such subjects seriously to anyone like me. End of Part 2, Chapter 1 Read by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon Part 2, Chapter 2 of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. Part 2, Chapter 2. 1. On that morning, the 15th of November, I found him at Prince Sergei's. I had brought the prince and him together, but they had ties apart from me. I mean, the affair abroad and all that. Moreover, the prince had promised to divide the disputed fortune with him, giving him a third, which would mean 20,000 at least. I remember at the time I thought it awfully strange that he was giving him only a third and not the full half, but I said nothing. Prince Sergei gave this promise of his own accord. Versilov had not said a syllable to suggest it, had not dropped a hint. Prince Sergei came forward himself, and Versilov only let it pass in silence never once alluded to it, and showed no sign that he had the least recollection of a promise. I may mention, by the way, that Prince Sergei was absolutely enchanted with him at first, and still more with the things he said. He fell into positive raptures about him, and several times expressed his feelings to me. And sometimes when he was alone with me, he exclaimed about himself, almost with despair, that he was so ill-educated, that he was on the wrong track. Oh, we were still so friendly then. I kept trying to impress Versilov with Prince Sergei's good points only, and excused his defects, though I saw them myself, but Versilov listened in silence, or smiled. If he has faults, he has at least as many virtues as defects, I once exclaimed to Versilov when I was alone with him. Goodness, how you flatter him, he said, laughing. How do I flatter him, I said, not understanding. As many virtues, why, he must be a saint if he has as many virtues as defects. But of course, that was not his opinion. In general, he avoided speaking of Prince Sergei at that time, as he did indeed of everything real, but of the prince particularly. I suspected even then that he went to see Prince Sergei without me, and that they were on rather peculiar terms, but I did not go into that. I was not jealous either at his talking to him more seriously than to me, more positively, so to speak, with less mockery. I was so happy at the time that I was actually pleased at it. I explained it, too, by Prince Sergei's being of rather limited intelligence, and so being fond of verbal exactitude, some jests he absolutely failed to see. But of late he had, as it were, begun to emancipate himself. His feelings for Versilov seemed beginning to change. Versilov, with his delicate perception, noticed it. I may mention at this point that Prince Sergei's attitude to me, too, became different at the same time, rather too obviously, in fact. Only the lifeless forms of our warm earlier relations were maintained. Yet I went on going to see him. I could not indeed help it, having once been drawn into it. Oh, how clumsy and inexperienced I was then. It is almost beyond belief that mere foolishness of heart can have brought anyone to such humiliation and lack of perception. I took money from him and thought that it didn't matter, that it was quite right. Yet that is not true. Even then I knew that it was not right, but it was simply that I thought very little about it. I did not go to the prince to get money, though I needed the money so much. I knew I did not go for the sake of the money, but I realized that I went every day to borrow money. 
but I was in a whirl then, and besides all that, I had something very different in my soul. It was singing with joy. When I went in at eleven o'clock in the morning, I found Versilov just finishing a long tirade. Prince Sergei was walking about the room listening, and Versilov was sitting down. Prince Sergei seemed in some excitement. Versilov was almost always able to work him into a state of excitement. He was exceedingly impressionable, to a degree of simplicity indeed, which had often made me look down on him. But I repeat, of late I had detected in him something like a resentful sneer. He stopped short seeing me, and a quiver seemed to pass over his face. I knew in my heart to what to attribute the shadow over him that morning, but I had not expected that his face would be so distorted by it. I knew that he had an accumulation of anxieties, but it was revolting that I didn't know more than a tenth part of them. The rest had been kept so far a dead secret from me. What made it stupid and revolting was that I often obtruded my sympathy on him, gave advice, and often laughed condescendingly at his weakness at being so upset about such trifles. He used to be silent, but he must have detested me at those moments. I was in an utterly false position and had no suspicion of it. Oh, I call God to witness that of the chief trouble, I had no suspicion. He courteously held out his hand to me, however. Versilov nodded without interrupting himself. I stretched myself on the sofa. My tone and manners were horrible at that time. My swagger went even further. I used to treat his acquaintances as though they were my own. Oh, if it could only be done all over again, I should know how to behave very differently. Two words that I may not forget. Prince Sergei was still living in the same flat, but now occupied almost the whole of it. Mademoiselle Stolbiev, whose flat it was, after staying only a month, had gone away again. 2. They were talking of the aristocracy. I may mention that Prince Sergei grew sometimes much excited over this subject in spite of his progressive notions. I suspect, indeed, that many of his misdoings had their source and origin in this idea. Attaching great significance to his princely rank, he threw money away in all directions, although he was a beggar and became involved in debt. Versilov had more than once hinted that this extravagance was not the essence of princeliness and tried to instill into him a higher conception of it. But Prince Sergei had begun to show signs of resentment at being instructed. Evidently, there had been something of the same sort that morning, but I hadn't arrived in time for the beginning of it. Versilov's words struck me at first as reactionary, but he made up for that later on. The word honor means duty, he said. I only give the sense as far as I remember it. When the upper class rules in a state, the country is strong. The upper class always has its sense of honor and its code of honor, which may be imperfect, but almost always serves as a bond and strengthens the country, an advantage morally and still more politically. But the slaves, that is, all those not belonging to the ruling class, suffer. They are given equal rights to prevent their suffering. That's what has been done with us, and it's an excellent thing. But in all experience so far, in Europe, that is to say, a weakening of the sense of honor and duty has followed the establishment of equal rights. Egoism has replaced the old consolidating principle, and the whole system has been shattered on the rock of personal freedom. The emancipated masses, left with no sustaining principle, have ended by losing all sense of cohesion till they have given up defending the liberties they have gained. But the Russian type of aristocrat has never been like the European nobility. Our nobility, even now that it has lost its privileges, might remain the leading class as the upholders of honor, enlightenment, science, and higher culture, and what is of the greatest importance without cutting themselves into a separate caste, which would be the death of the idea. On the contrary, the entrance to this class has been thrown open long ago among us, and now the time has come to open it completely. Let every honorable and valiant action, every great achievement in science enable a man to gain the ranks of the highest class. In that way, the class is automatically transformed into an assembly of the best people in a true and literal sense, not in the sense in which it was said of the privileged caste in the past. In this new or rather renewed form, the class might be retained. The prince smiled sarcastically. What sort of an aristocracy would that be? It's some sort of Masonic lodge you're sketching, not an aristocracy. Prince Sergei had been, I repeat, extremely ill-educated. 
I turned over with vexation on the sofa, though I was far from agreeing with Versilov. Versilov quite understood that the prince was sneering. I don't know in what sense you talk of a Masonic lodge, he answered. Well, if even a Russian prince recoils from such an idea, no doubt the time for it has not arrived. The idea of honor and enlightenment as the sacred keys that unlock for any man the portals of a class thus continually renewed is, of course, a utopia. But why is it an impossible one? If the thought is living only in a few brains, it is not yet lost, but shines like a tiny flame in the depths of darkness. You are fond of using such words as higher culture, great idea, sustaining principle, and such. I should like to know what you mean exactly by a great idea. I really don't know how to answer that question, dear prince, Versilov responded with a subtle smile. If I confess to you that I myself am not able to answer, it would be more accurate. A great idea is most often a feeling which sometimes remains too long undefined. I only know that it's that which has been the source of living life, gay, joyous life, I mean, not theoretical and artificial, so that the great idea from which it flows is absolutely indispensable to the general vexation, of course. Why vexation? Because to live with ideas is dreary, and it's always gay without them. The prince swallowed the rebuke. And what do you mean by this living life, as you call it? He was evidently cross. I don't know that either, prince. I only know that it must be something very simple, the most everyday thing, staring us in the face, a thing of every day, every minute, and so simple that we can never believe it to be so simple. And we've naturally been passing it by for thousands of years without noticing it or recognizing it. I only meant to say that your idea of the aristocracy is equivalent to denying the aristocracy, observed Prince Sergei. Well, if you will have it so, perhaps there never has been an aristocracy in Russia. All this is very obscure and vague. If one says something, one ought, to my mind, to explain it. Prince Sergei contracted his brows and stole a glance at the clock on the wall. Versilov got up and took his hat. Explain, he said. No, it's better not to. Besides, I have a passion for talking without explanations. That's really it. And there's another strange thing. If it happens that I try to explain an idea I believe in, it almost always happens that I cease to believe what I have explained. I'm afraid of that fate now. Goodbye, dear prince. I always chatter unpardonably with you. He went out. The prince escorted him politely, but I felt offended. What are you ruffling up your feathers about? He fired off suddenly, walking past me to his bureau without looking at me. I'm ruffling up my feathers, I began with a tremor in my voice, because finding in you such a queer change of tone to me and even to Versilov, I... Versilov may, of course, have begun in rather a reactionary way, but afterwards he made up for it, and there was perhaps a profound meaning in what he said, but you simply didn't understand, and... I simply don't care to have people putting themselves forward to teach me and treating me as though I were a schoolboy, he snapped out almost wrathfully. Prince, such expressions, please spare me theatrical flourishes if you will be so kind. I know that what I am doing is contemptible, that I am a spendthrift, a gambler, perhaps a thief, yes, a thief for I gamble away the money belonging to my family. But I don't want anybody's judgment. I don't want it, and I won't have it. I'm the judge of my own actions. And why this ambiguity? If he wants to say anything to me, let him say it straight out, and not go in for this mysterious prophetic twaddle. To tell me all this, he ought to have the right to. He ought to be an honorable man himself. In the first place, I didn't come in at the beginning, and I don't know what you were talking about. And secondly, what has Versilov done dishonorable, allow me to ask? Please, that's enough, that's enough. You asked me for 300 rubles yesterday. Here it is. He laid the money on the table before me, sat down in the armchair, leaned nervously against the back of it, and crossed one leg over the other. I was thrown into confusion. I don't know, I muttered. Though I did ask you for it, and though I do need the money now, since you take such a tone... Don't 
talk about tone. If I spoke sharply, you must excuse me. I assure you that I've no thoughts to spare for it. Listen to this. I've had a letter from Moscow. My brother Sasha, who was only a child, as you know, died four days ago. My father, as you know, has been paralyzed for the last two years, and now they write to me he's worse. He can't utter a word and knows nobody. They were relieved to get the inheritance and want to take him abroad, but the doctor writes that he's not likely to live a fortnight. So I'm left with my mother and sister, that is, almost alone. In fact, I'm alone. This fortune, this fortune, oh, it would have been better perhaps if it had not come to me at all. But this is what I wanted to tell you. I promise Andrei Petrovich a minimum of 20,000. And meanwhile, only imagine, owing to legal formalities, I've been able to do nothing. I haven't even, we, that is, my father, that is, has not yet been informed of the inheritance. And meanwhile, I've lost so much money during the last three weeks, and that scoundrel Stebelkov charges such a rate of interest, I've given you almost the last. Oh, Prince, if that's how it is. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. Stebelkov will bring some today, no doubt, and there'll be enough to go on with. But what the devil's one to think of Stebelkov? I entreated him to get me 10000 so that I might at least give Andrei Petrovich that much. It worries me. It plagues me to think of my promise to give him a third. I gave my word, and I must keep it, and I swear I'll do my utmost to free myself from obligations in that direction anyhow. They weigh upon me. They weigh upon me. They're insufferable. This burdensome tie. I can't bear to see Andrei Petrovich, for I can't look him in the face. Why does he take advantage of it? What does he take advantage of, Prince? I stood before him in amazement. Has he ever so much as hinted at it? Oh, no. And I appreciate it. It's I who reproach myself. And in fact, I'm getting more and more involved. This Stebokov. Listen, Prince, do calm yourself, please. I see you get more excited the more you talk, and yet it may be all imagination. Oh, I've got myself into difficulties, too, unpardonably, contemptibly. But I know it's only temporary, and as soon as I win back a certain sum, then... I say with this 300, I owe you 2,500, don't I? I'm not asking it from you, I believe. The prince said suddenly with a sneer. You say 10,000 for Versilov. If I borrow from you now the money will be taken off Versilov's 20,000. Otherwise I won't consent. But, but I shall certainly pay it back myself. But can you possibly imagine that Versilov comes to you to get the money? It would be easier for me if he did come for the money, Prince Sergei observed enigmatically. You talk of some burdensome tie. If you mean with Versilov and me, upon my soul, it's an insult. And you say, why isn't he what he preaches? That's your logic. And in the first place, it's not logic, allow me to tell you. For even if he's not, he can't help saying what's true. And besides, why do you talk about preaching? You call him a prophet. Tell me, was it you who called him a petticoat prophet in Germany? No, it was not I. Stebelkov told me it was you. He told a lie. I'm no hand at giving derisive nicknames. But if a man preaches honor, he ought to be honorable himself. That's my logic. And if it's incorrect, I don't care. I prefer it to be so. And I won't have anyone dare to come and judge me in my own house and treat me like a baby. That's enough, he shouted, waving his hand to stop me. Ah, at last. The door opened, and Stebelkov walked in. Three. He was exactly the same, just as jauntily dressed and squared his chest and stared into one's face as stupidly as ever, imagining that he was being very sly and exceedingly well satisfied with himself. On this occasion, he looked about him in a strange way on entering. There was a look of peculiar caution and penetration in his face, as though he wanted to guess something from our countenances. 
He instantly subsided, however, and his face beamed with a self-satisfied smile, that pardonably insolent smile which was yet unspeakably repulsive to me. I had known for a long time that he was a great torment to Prince Sergei. He had come once or twice when I was present. I, I too, had had a transaction with him during that month, but on this occasion I was rather surprised at the way he came in. In a minute! Prince Sergei said without greeting him, and turning his back on us both, he began looking in his desk for the necessary papers and accounts. As for me, I was mortally offended by his last words. The suggestion that Verisilov was dishonorable was so clear and so astonishing that it could not be allowed to pass without a full explanation. But that was impossible before Stebokov. I reclined on the sofa again and turned over a book that was lying before me. Bielinski, part two. That's something new. Are you trying to cultivate your mind? I exclaimed. I fancy very unnaturally. He was busily engaged and in great haste, but at my words he turned. I beg you to leave that book alone, he brought out sharply. This was beyond all endurance, especially before Stebelkov. To make it worse, Stebelkov made a sly and loathsome smirk and made a stealthy sign to me in Prince Sergei's direction. I turned away from the fool. Don't be angry, Prince. I'll leave you to your most important visitor, and meanwhile, I'll disappear. I made up my mind to be casual in my manner. Is that me, the most important visitor? Stebelkov put in, jocosely pointing at himself with his finger. Yes, you! You're the most important person, and you know it, too. No, excuse me. Everywhere in the world there's a second person. I am a second person. There's a first person, and a second person. The first acts, and the second takes. So the first person turns into the second person, and the second person turns into the first person. Is that so or not? It may be so, but as usual, I don't understand you. Excuse me. In France, there was a revolution and everyone was executed. Napoleon came along and took everything. The revolution is the first person and Napoleon the second person. But it turned out that the revolution became the second person and Napoleon became the first person. Is that right? I may observe, by the way, that in his speaking to me of the French Revolution, I saw an instance of his own cunning which amused me very much. He still persisted in regarding me as some sort of revolutionist, and whenever he met me, thought it necessary to begin on some topic of the sort. Come along, said Prince Sergei, and they went together into the other room. As soon as I was alone, I made up my mind to give him back the three hundred as soon as Stebelkov had gone. I needed the money terribly, still I resolved to do so. They remained in the other room, and for ten minutes I heard nothing. Then suddenly they began talking loudly. They were both talking, but Prince Sergei suddenly shouted as though in violent irritation, approaching frenzy. He was sometimes very hasty, so that I was not surprised. But at that moment, a footman came in to announce a visitor. I motioned him to the other room, and instantly there was silence there. Prince Sergei came out with an anxious face, though he smiled. The footman hastened away, and half a minute later a visitor came in. It was a visitor of great consequence, with shoulder knots and a family crest. He was a gentleman, not over thirty, of high rank and of severe appearance. I may remark that Prince Sergei did not really belong to the highest circles in Petersburg in spite of his passionate desire to do so. I was aware of this desire, and so he must have been glad to see a visitor like this. The acquaintance had, as I knew, only been formed through great efforts on the part of Prince Sergei. The guest was returning Prince Sergei's visit, and unhappily came upon him at the wrong moment. I saw Prince Sergei look at Stebelkov with an agonized and hopeless expression, but Stebelkov encountered his eyes as though nothing whatever were the matter, and without the faintest idea of effacing himself, sat down on the sofa with a free and easy air, and began passing his hand through his hair probably to display his independence. He even assumed an important countenance. In fact, he was utterly impossible. As for me, I knew, of course, how to behave decently even then, and should never have disgraced anyone. But what was my amazement when I caught on Prince Sergei's face the same hopeless, miserable, and vindictive look directed at me? He was ashamed of us both then, and put me on a level with Stebelkov. That idea drove me to fury. 
I lulled even more at my ease and began turning over the leaves of the book as though the position were no concern of mine. Stebelkov, on the contrary, bent forward open-eyed to listen to their conversation, probably supposing that this was a polite and affable thing to do. The visitor glanced once or twice at Stebelkov, and at me too, indeed. They talked of family news. This gentleman had at some time known Prince Sergei's mother, who was one of a distinguished family. From what I could gather, in spite of his politeness and the apparent good nature of his tone, the visitor was very formal and evidently valued his own dignity so highly as to consider a visit from him an honor to anyone whatever. Had Prince Sergei been alone, that is, had we not been present, he would certainly have been more dignified and more resourceful. As it was, something tremulous in his smile, possibly an excess of politeness and a strange absent-mindedness, betrayed him. They had hardly been sitting there five minutes when another visitor was announced, also of the compromising kind. I knew this one very well and had heard a great deal about him, though he did not know me at all. He was still quite a young man, though twenty-three, who was handsome and elegantly dressed and had a fine house, but moved in distinctly doubtful circles. A year before he had been serving in one of the smartest cavalry regiments, but had been forced to give up his commission, and everyone knew for what reason. His relations had even advertised in the papers that they would not be responsible for his debts, but he still continued his profligate manner of life, borrowing money at 10% a month, playing desperately in gambling circles, and squandering his money on a notorious Frenchwoman. A week before, he had succeeded one evening in winning 12,000 rubles, and was triumphant. He was on friendly terms with Prince Sergei. They often played together, tete-a-tete. -tete. But Prince Sergei positively shuddered seeing him now. I noticed this from where I lay. This youth made himself at home everywhere, talked with noisy gaiety, saying anything that came into his head without restraint. And of course, it could never have occurred to him that our host was in such a panic over the impression his associates would make upon his important visitor. He interrupted their conversation by his entrance and began at once describing his play on the previous day before he had even sat down. I believe you were there too, he said, breaking off at the third sentence to address the important gentleman, mistaking him for one of his own set, but looking at him more closely, he cried at once, Oh, I beg your pardon, I mistook you for one of the party yesterday. Alexey Vladimirovich Darzan? Ippolit Alexandrovich Nastokin, Prince Sergei made haste to introduce them. This youth could still be introduced. He belonged to a good family, and it was a distinguished name. But us he did not introduce, and we went on sitting in our corners. I absolutely refused to turn my head in their direction, but Stebelkov began smirking gleefully at the sight of the young man, and was unmistakably threatening to begin talking. This began to amuse me. I met you several times last year at Countess Verigens, said Darzan. I remember you, but I believe you were in military uniform then, Nastrokin observed genially. Yes, I was, but thanks to... But Stebelkov here, how does he come here? It's just thanks to these pretty gentlemen here that I'm not in the army now. He pointed to Stebelkov and burst out laughing. Stebelkov laughed gleefully, too, probably taking it as a compliment. Prince Sergei blushed and made haste to address a question to Nastrokin, and Darzan, going up to Stebelkov, began talking something very warmly, though in a whisper. I believe you saw a great deal of Katerina Nikolaevna Amakov abroad, the visitor asked Prince Sergei. Oh, yes, I knew her. I believe we shall soon be hearing a piece of news about her. They say she's engaged to Baron Bouring. That's true, cried Darzan. Do you know it for a fact? Prince Sergei asked Nastrokin with evident agitation, bringing out his question with peculiar emphasis. I've been told so, and people are talking about it, but I don't know it for a fact. Oh, it is a fact, said Darzan, going up to him. Dubasov told me so yesterday. He's always the first to know news like that. Yes, and the prince ought to know. Nastrokin waited till Darzan had finished and turned to Prince Sergei again. 
She is not very often seen now. Her father has been ill for the last month, Prince Sergei observed dryly. She's a lady of many adventures, Darzan blurted out suddenly. I raised my head and sat up. I have the pleasure of knowing Katerina Nikolaevna personally, and I take upon myself the duty of declaring that all scandalous stories about her are mere lies and infamy, and invented by those who have sought her favor without success. After this stupid outburst, I relapsed into silence, still sitting upright and gazing at them all with a flushed face. Everyone turned to me, but Stebelkov suddenly guffawed. Darzan, too, simpered and seemed surprised. Arkady Makarovich Dolgoruki, said Prince Sergei, indicating me to Darzan. Oh, believe me, Prince, said Darzan, frankly and good-naturedly addressing me. I am only repeating what I've heard. If there are rumors, they have not been of my spreading. I did not mean it for you, I answered quickly, but Stebelkov had burst into an outrageous roar of laughter, caused, as he explained afterwards, by Darzan's having addressed me as Prince. My diabolical surname had got me into a mess again. Even now I blush at the thought that I had not the courage, through shame of course, to set right this blunder and to protest aloud that I was simply Dolgoruki. It was the first time in my life I had let it pass. Darzan looked in perplexity at me and at Stebelkov's laughter. Ah, yes, who was the pretty girl I met on the stairs just now? A slim, fair little thing, he suddenly asked Prince Sergei. I really don't know, the latter answered quickly, reddening. How should you, laughed Darzan. Though it, it might have been, Prince Sergei faltered oddly. It was this gentleman's sister, Lizaveta Makarovna, said Stebelkov, suddenly pointing to me, for I met her just now, too. Ah, indeed, Prince Sergei put in quickly, speaking this time, however, with an extremely grave and dignified expression. It must have been Lizaveta Makarovna, who is a great friend of Anna Fyodorovna Stolbiev, in whose flat I am staying. She must have come today to see Darya Anisimovna, another of Anna Fyodorovna's great friends, whom she left in charge of the house when she went away. This was all true. Darya Anisimovna was the mother of poor Olya, whose story I have told already. Tatiana Pavlovna had found a refuge for the poor woman at last with Mademoiselle Stolbiev. I know very well that Liza had been sometimes at Mademoiselle Stolbiev's and had lately visited there Darya Anisimovna, of whom everyone at home was very fond. But after this statement by Prince Sergei, sensible as it was, however, and still more Stebelkov's stupid outburst, and perhaps because I had been called Prince, I suddenly flushed all over. Luckily, at that very instant, Nastjokin stood up to take leave. He offered his hand to Darzan also. At the moment, Stebelkov and I were left alone. He nodded his head to me in the direction of Darzan who was standing in the doorway with his back to us. I shook my fist at Stebelkov. A minute later, Darzan, too, got up to go, after arranging with Prince Sergei to meet him next day at some place, a gambling house, I believe. As he went out, he shouted something to Stebelkov and made me a slight bow. Hardly had he gone out when Stebelkov jumped up and stood in the middle of the room, pointing to the ceiling with his finger. I'll tell you the trick that fine young gentleman played last week. He gave an IOU to Averyanov and signed a false name to it. That IOU is still in existence, but it's not been honored. It's criminal. Eight thousand. And no doubt that IOU is in your hands, I cried, glaring at him savagely. I have a bank. I have a Mont de Piete. I am not a broker. Have you heard that there is a Mont de Piete in Paris? Bread and benevolence for the poor. I have a Monte de Piete. Prince Sergei rudely and angrily cut him short. What are you doing here? What are you staying for? But, Stebelkov blinked rapidly. What about that? Won't it do? No, 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 Prince Sergei shouted, stamping. I've said so. Well, if so, that's so. But that's a mistake. He turned abruptly and, with bowed head and bent spine, went quickly out of the room. Prince Sergei called after him when he was in the doorway. You may as well know, sir, that I am not in the least afraid of you. 
He was very much irritated. He was about to sit down, but glancing at me, remained standing. His eyes seemed to say to me also, Why are you hanging about here too? Prince, I... I was beginning. I really no time to listen, Arkady Makarovich. I'm just going out. One minute, Prince. It's very important. And to begin with, take back your 300. What's this now? He was walking up and down, but he stopped short. This now is that after all that has passed, and what you've said about Verslov, that he was dishonorable, and in fact your tone all the time. In short, I can't possibly take it. You've been taking it for the last month, though. He suddenly sat down on the chair. I was standing at the table, and with one hand I patted the volume of Bielinski while I held my hat in the other. I had different feelings, Prince, and in fact I would never have brought it to such a sum. It was the gambling. In short, I can't. You have not distinguished yourself today, and so you are in a rage. I'll ask you to leave that book alone. What does that mean, not distinguished myself? And in fact, before your visitors, you almost put me on a level with Stebelkov. So that's the key to the riddle, he said with a biting smile. You were abashed by Darzen's calling you Prince, too. He laughed spitefully. I flared up. I simply don't understand. I wouldn't take your title as a gift. I know your character. How absurdly you cried out in defense of Mademoiselle Amakov. Let that book alone. What's the meaning of it? I cried. Let the book alone, he yelled suddenly, drawing himself up in the low chair with a ferocious movement as though about to spring at me. This is beyond all limits, I said, and I walked quickly out of the room, but before I had reached the end of the drawing room, he shouted to me from the study, Arkady Makarovich, come back, come back, come back. I went on without heeding. He hastily overtook me, seized me by the arm, and dragged me back into the study. I did not resist. Take it, he said, pale with excitement, handing me the three hundred roubles I had thrown on the table. You must take it, or else we... you must. Prince, how can I take it? Oh, I'll beg your pardon, if you like. All right, forgive me. I have always liked you, Prince, and if you feel the same, I do. Take it. I took the money. His lips were trembling. I can understand, Prince, that you are exasperated by that scoundrel. But I won't take it, Prince, unless we kiss each other, as we have done when we've quarreled before. I was trembling, too, as I said this. Now for sentimentality, muttered Prince Sergei with an embarrassed smile. But he bent down and kissed me. I shuddered. At the instant he kissed me, I caught on his face an unmistakable look of aversion. Did he bring you the money anyway? I never mind. I was asking on your account. Yes, he did. He did. Prince, we have been friends. And in fact, Verslov. Yes, yes, that's all right. And in fact, I really don't know about this 300. I was holding the money in my hand. Take it! Take it! He smiled again, but there was something very vicious in his smile. I took the money. End of part two, chapter two. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. Part 2, Chapter 3 of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. Part 2, Chapter 3. I took the money because I loved him. If anyone disbelieves this, I must inform him that at the moment when I took the money, I was firmly convinced that I could have obtained it from another source. And so I really took it, not because I was in desperate straits, but from delicacy, not to hurt his feelings. Alas, that was how I reasoned at the time, but yet my heart was very heavy as I went out from him. I had seen that morning an extraordinary change in his attitude to me. 
he had never taken such a tone before, and as regards Versilov, it was a case of positive mutiny. Stebelkov had no doubt annoyed him very much that morning, but he had begun to be the same before seeing Stebelkov. I repeat once more, the change from his original manner might indeed have been noticed for some days past, but not in the same way, not in the same degree. That was the point. The stupid gossip about that major Baron Boring might have some effect on him. I too had been disturbed by it, but the fact is, I had something else in my heart at that time that shone so resplendent that I heedlessly let many things pass unnoticed, made haste to let them pass, to get rid of them, to go back to that resplendence. It was not yet one o'clock. From Prince Sergei's I drove with my Matvi straight off to, it will hardly be believed to whom, to Stebelkov! The fact is that he had surprised me that morning not so much by turning up at Prince Sergei's, for he had promised to be there, as by the way he had winked at me. He had a stupid habit of doing so, but that morning it had been apropos of a different subject from what I had expected. An evening before, a note had come from him by post, which had rather puzzled me. In it, he begged me to go to him between two and three today, and that he might inform me of facts that would be a surprise to me. And in reference to that letter he had that morning, at Prince Sergei's, made no sign whatever. What sort of secrets could there be between Stebelkov and me? Such an idea was positively ridiculous, but after all that had happened, I felt a slight excitement as I drove off to him. I had, of course, a fortnight before applied to him for money, and he was ready to lend it. But for some reason, we did not come to terms, and I did not take the money. On that occasion, too, he had muttered something vague, as his habit was, and I had fancied he wanted to make me some offer, to suggest some special conditions. And as I had treated him disdainfully every time I had met him at Prince Sergei's, I proudly cut short any idea of special terms, though he pursued me to the door. I borrowed the money afterwards from Prince Sergei. Stavlokov lived in a very comfortable style. He had his own establishment, a flat of four rooms, with handsome furniture, men and women servants, and a housekeeper who was, however, by no means young. I went in angrily. Listen, my good man, I began from the door. To begin with, what's the meaning of that letter? I don't care for letters to be passing between us. And why did you not make any statement you wanted to make at Prince Sergei's this morning? I was at your service. And why did you hold your tongue, too, this morning instead of questioning me? He said with a broad grin of intense self-satisfaction. Because it's not I want something of you, but you want something of me, I cried, suddenly growing hot. Why have you come to see me, if that's so? He cried, almost jumping out of his chair with glee. I turned instantly and would have gone out, but he seized me by my shoulder. No, no, I was joking. It's a matter of importance, as you'll see for yourself. I sat down. I must admit I was inquisitive. We were seated facing one another at the end of a big writing table. He smiled slyly and was just holding up his finger. None of your slyness, please, and no fingers either, and above all, none of your allegories. Come straight to the point or I'll go away at once, I cried angrily again. You are proud, he pronounced in a tone of stupid reproach, rocking in his easy chair and turning his wrinkled forehead towards the ceiling. One has to be with you. You took money from Prince Sergei today. 300 rubles. I have money too. My money is better than his. How do you know I took it? I asked, greatly astonished. He told me, don't worry yourself. In the course of conversation, it happened to come up. It just happened to come up. It was not on purpose. He told me, and you need not have taken it. Is that so or not? But I hear that you squeeze out an exorbitant interest. I have a monte de piete, but I don't squeeze. I only lend to friends and not to other people. The monte de piete is for them. This monte de piete was an ordinary pawnbroker's shop, which flourished under another name in a different quarter of town. But I lend large sums to friends. Why, is Prince Sergei such a friend of yours? A friend, but he plays the fool, and he'd better not dare to play the fool. Why is he so much in your power? Does he owe you a great deal? He does owe a great deal. He'll pay you. He has come into a fortune. That is not his fortune. He owes money and owes something else, too. The fortune's not enough. I'll lend to you without interest. As though I were a friend, too? 
How have I earned that? I laughed. You will earn it. Again, he rocked his whole person forward on a level with me and was again holding up his fingers. Stabokov, speak without flourishing your fingers or I go. I say he may marry Anna Andreevna. And he screwed up his left eye fiendishly. Listen, Stabokov, your conversation is taking a scandalous turn. How dare you utter the name of Anna Andreevna? Don't lose your temper. I am listening, though it's against the grain, for I see clearly you have something up your sleeve, and I want to find out what it is. But you may try my patience too far, Stebelkov. Don't be angry, don't be proud, humble your pride a little and listen, and then you'll be proud again. You know, of course, about Anna Andreevna. The prince may make a match, you know, of course. I have heard of the idea, of course, I know all about it, but I have never spoken to Prince Sergei about it. I only know that the idea originated with old Prince Sikolsky, who is ill now, but I have never talked to him about it, and I have had nothing to do with it. I tell you this simply to make things clear. I will ask you in the first place, what is your object in mentioning it to me? And secondly, can Prince Sergei possibly discuss such subjects with you? He does not discuss them with me. He does not want to discuss them with me, but I mention them to him, and he does not want to listen. He shouted at me this morning. I should think so. I commend him. Old Prince Sikolsky will give Anna Andreevna a good dowry. She's a favorite. Then when the prince marries her, he'll repay me all the money he owes, and he will pay other debts as well. He'll certainly pay them, but now he has nothing to pay with. What do you want of me? To answer the great question, you are known everywhere. You go everywhere. You can find out anything. Oh, damnation, find out what? Whether Prince Sergei wishes it, whether Anna Andreevna wishes it, whether the old prince wishes it. And you dare propose that I should be your spy? And for money? I burst out indignantly. Don't be too proud. Don't be too proud. Humble your pride only a little. Only for five minutes. He made me sit down again. He was evidently not intimidated by my words or gestures, but I made up my mind to hear him out. I must find out quickly. Find out quickly because, because it will soon be too late. You saw how he swallowed the pill this morning when the officer mentioned the Baron for Mademoiselle Amakov. I certainly demeaned myself by listening further, but my curiosity was irresistibly aroused. Listen, you worthless fellow, I said resolutely. Though I'm sitting here and listening and allow you to speak of such persons and even answer you, it's not in the least that I admit your right to do so. I simply see in it some piece of rascality, and in the first place, what hopes can Prince Sergei have in reference to Katerina Nikolaevna? None whatever, yet he is furious. That's untrue. Yes, he is. Mademoiselle Amakov is no go then now. He has lost that stake. Now he has only Anna Andreevna to fall back on. I will give you 2,000 without interest and without an IOU. Having delivered himself of this, he sat back in his chair with a determined and important expression and stared goggle-eyed at me. I too stared. You've a suit from Bolshaya Miliona. You need money. You want money. My money's better than his. I will give you more than 2,000. But what for? What for? Damn it all! I stamped my foot. He bent towards me and brought out impressively, For you not to hinder. But I'm not interfering as it is, I shouted. I know that you are holding your tongue. That's excellent. I don't want your approbation. For my part, I am very anxious for it myself but I consider it's not my business, and in fact, that it would be unseemly for me to meddle. There, you see, you see, unseemly, he held up his finger. What do you see? Unseemly, ha! And he suddenly laughed. I understand, I understand that it would be unseemly of you, but you won't interfere? He winked. But in that wink, there was something so insolent so low and even jeering. Evidently, he was assuming some meanness on my part and was reckoning upon it. That was clear, but I hadn't a notion what was meant. 
Anna Andreevna is your sister, too, he pronounced insinuatingly. Don't you dare speak of that. And in fact, don't dare to speak of Anna Andreevna at all. Don't be too proud. Only one more minute. Listen, he will get the money and provide for everyone, Stebokov said impressively. Everyone, everyone. You follow? So you think I'll take money from him? You are taking it now. I'm taking my own. How is it your own? It's Versilov's money. He owes Versilov 20,000. Versilov, then, not you. Versilov is my father. No, you are a Dolgoruki, not a Versilov. It's all the same. Yes, indeed, I was able to argue like that then. I knew it was not the same. I was not so stupid as all that. But again, it was from delicacy that I reasoned so. Enough, I cried. I can't make out what you were talking about, and how dare you ask me to come for such nonsense. Can you really not understand? Is it on purpose or not? Stabokov brought out slowly, looking at me with a penetrating and incredulous smile. I swear I don't understand. I tell you, he'll be able to provide for everyone, everyone. You've only not to interfere, and don't try to persuade him. You must have gone out of your mind. Why do you keep trotting out that everyone? Do you mean he'll provide for Versilov? You're not the only one. Nor Versilov either. There's someone else too. And Anna Andreevna is just as much your sister as Lizaveta Makarovna. I gazed at him open-eyed. There was a sudden glimpse of something like compassion for me in his loathsome eyes. You don't understand. So much the better. That's good. Very good that you don't understand. It's very laudable if you really don't understand. I was absolutely furious. Go to hell with your silly nonsense, you madman, I shouted, taking up my hat. It's not silly nonsense. So you are going, but you'll come again, you know. No, I rapped out in the doorway. You'll come. And then we shall have another talk. That will be the real talk. Two thousand. Remember. Two. He made such a filthy and confused impression on me that when I got out, I tried not to think of it at all, but dismissed it with a curse. The idea that Prince Sergei was capable of talking to him of me and of that money stabbed me like a pin. I'll win and pay him back today, I thought resolutely. Stupid and inarticulate as Stabokov was, I had seen the full-blown scoundrel in all his glory. And what mattered most to me, it was impossible to avoid intrigue in this business. Only I had not the time just then to go into any sort of intrigues, and that may have been the chief reason why I was blind as a hen. I looked anxiously at my watch, but it was not yet two o'clock, so it was still possible to pay a call. Otherwise, I should have been worn out with excitement before three o'clock. I went to Anna Andreevna Versilov, my sister. I had got to know her some time before at my old prince's, during his illness. He thought that I had not seen him for three or four days, fretted my conscience, but I was reckoning on Anna Andreevna. The old prince had become extremely attached to her of late and even spoke of her to me as his guardian angel. And by the way, the idea of marrying her to Prince Sergei really had occurred to the old prince, and he had even expressed it more than once to me, in secret, of course. I had mentioned this suggestion to Versilov, for I had noticed that though he was so indifferent to all the practical affairs of life, he seemed particularly interested whenever I told him of my meeting Anna Andreevna. When I mentioned the old prince's idea, Versilov muttered that Anna Andreevna had plenty of sense and was quite capable of getting out of a delicate position without the advice of outsiders. Stebokov was right, of course, in saying that the old man meant to give her a dowry, but how could he dare to reckon on getting anything out of it? Prince Sergei had shouted after him that morning that he was not in the least afraid of him. Surely Stebokov had not actually spoken to him of Anna Andreevna in the study. I could fancy how furious I should have been in Prince Sergei's place. I had been to see Anna Andreevna pretty often of late. 
but there was one queer thing about my visits. It always happened that she arranged for me to come and certainly expected me, but when I went in, she always made a pretense of my having come unexpectedly and by chance. I noticed this peculiarity in her, but I became much attached to her nevertheless. She lived with Mademoiselle Fenaryatov, her grandmother, as an adopted child, of course. Versilov had never contributed anything for her keep. But she was very far from being in the position in which the protégés of illustrious ladies are usually described as being. For instance, the one in the house of the old countess and Pushkin's queen of spades. Anna Andreevna was more in the position of the countess herself. She lived quite independently in the house. That is to say, though in the same story and in the same flat as the Fenariatovs, she had two rooms completely apart, so that I, for instance, never once met any of the family as I went in or came out. She was free to receive any visitors she liked and to employ her time as she chose. It is true that she was in her 23rd year. She had almost given up going out into society of late, though Mademoiselle Fenariatov spared no expense for her granddaughter, of whom I was told she was very fond. Yet what I particularly liked about Anna Andreevna was that I always found her so quietly dressed and always occupied with something, a book or needlework. There was something of the convent, even of the nun about her, and I liked it very much. She was not very talkative, but she always spoke with judgment and knew how to listen, which I never did. When I told her that she reminded me of Versilov, though they had not a feature in common, she always flushed a little. She often blushed and always quickly, invariably, with a faint blush, and I particularly liked this peculiarity in her face. I never spoke of Versilov by his surname, but always called him Andrei Petrovich, and this had somehow come to pass of itself. I gathered, indeed, that the Fenariatovs must have been ashamed of Versilov, though, indeed, I only drew this conclusion from Anna Andreevna, and again, I'm not sure that the word ashamed is appropriate in this connection, but there was some feeling of that sort. I talked to her about Prince Sergei, and she listened eagerly, and was, I fancy, interested in what I told her of him. But it somehow happened that I always spoke of him of my own accord, and she never questioned me about him. Of the possibility of a marriage between them, I had never dared to speak, though I often felt inclined to, for the idea was not without attraction to me. But there were very many things of which, in her room, I could not have ventured to speak, yet on the other hand, I felt very much at home there. Another thing I liked was that she was so well educated and had read so much. Real books, too. She had read far more than I had. She had invited me the first time of her own accord. I realized even at the time that she might be reckoning on getting some information out of me at one time or another. Oh, lots of people were able to get information of all sorts out of me in those days. But what of it, I thought. It's not only for that that she's asking me. In fact, I was positively glad to think I might be of use to her. And when I sat with her, I always felt that I had a sister sitting beside me, though we never once spoke of our relationship by so much as a word or a hint, but behaved as though it did not exist at all. When I was with her, it was absolutely unthinkable to speak of it. And indeed, looking at her, I was struck with the absurd notion that she might perhaps know nothing of our relationship. So completely did she ignore it in her manner to me. 3. When I went in, I found Lisa with her. This almost astonished me. I knew very well that they had seen each other before. They had met over the baby. I will, perhaps later on, if I have space, tell how Anna Andreevna, always so proud and so delicate, was possessed by the fantastic desire to see that baby, and how she had there met Lisa. But yet I had not expected that Anna Andreevna would ever have invited Lisa to come see her. It was a pleasant surprise to me. Giving no sign of this, of course, I greeted Anna Andreevna, and warmly pressing Lisa's hand, sat down beside her. Both were busily occupied, spread out on the table, and on their knees was an evening dress of Anna Andreevna's expensive but old, that is, worn three times, and Anna Andreevna wanted to alter it. Lisa was a master hand at such work and had real taste, and so a solemn council of wise women was being held. I recalled Versilov's words and laughed, and indeed I was in a radiantly happy state of mind. You are in very good spirits today, and that's very pleasant, observed Anna Andreevna, uttering her words gravely and distinctly. Her voice was a rich, mellow contralto, and she always spoke quietly and gently with a droop of her long eyelashes and a faint smile on her pale face. 
Lisa knows how disagreeable I am when I am not in good spirits, I answered gaily. Perhaps Anna Andreevna knows that too, mischievous Liva jibed at me. My darling, if I had known what was on her mind at that time. What are you doing now? asked Anna Andreevna. I may remark that she had asked me to come and see her that day. I am sitting here wondering why I always prefer to find you reading rather than with needlework. Yes, really, needlework doesn't suit you somehow. I agree with Andrei Petrovich about that. You still have not made up your mind to enter the university, then. I am very grateful to you for not having forgotten our conversation. It shows you think of me sometimes. But about the university, my ideas are not quite definite. Besides, I have plans of my own. That means he has a secret, observed Lisa. Leave off joking, Lisa. Some clever person said the other day that by our progressive movement of the last 20 years, we had proved about everything that we are filthily uneducated. That was meant for our university men, too. No doubt father said that, remarked Lisa. You very often repeat his ideas. Lisa, you seem to think I've no mind of my own. In these days, it's a good thing to listen to intelligent men and repeat their words, said Anna Andreevna, taking my part a little. Just so, Anna Andreevna, I assented warmly. The man who doesn't think of the position of Russia today is no patriot. I look at Russia, perhaps, from a strange point of view. We lived through the Tatar invasion and afterwards two centuries of slavery, no doubt because they both suited our tastes. Now freedom has been given us, and we have to put up with freedom. Shall we know how to? Will freedom, too, turn out to suit our taste? That's the question. Lisa glanced quickly at Anna Andreevna, and the latter immediately cast down her eyes and began looking for something. I saw that Lisa was doing her utmost to control herself, but all at once her eyes chanced to meet, and she burst into a fit of laughter. I flared up. Lisa, you are insupportable. Forgive me, she said suddenly, leaving off laughing and speaking almost sadly. Goodness knows what I can be thinking about and there was a tremor, almost as of tears in her voice. I felt horribly ashamed. I took her hand and kissed it warmly. You are very good, Anna Andreevna said softly, seeing me kiss Lisa's hand. I am awfully glad that I have found you laughing this time, Lisa, I said. Would you believe it, Anna Andreevna? Every time I have met her lately, she has greeted me with a strange look, and that look seemed to ask, has he found out something? Is everything all right? Really, there has been something like that about her. Anna Andreevna looked keenly and deliberately at her. Lisa dropped her eyes. I could see very clearly, however, that they were on much closer and more intimate terms than I could have possibly imagined. The thought was pleasant. You told me just now that I am good. You would not believe, Anna Andreevna, how much I change for the better when I am with you and how much I like being with you, I said with warmth. I am awfully glad that you say that just now, she answered with peculiar significance. I must mention that she never spoke to me of the reckless way I was living and the depths to which I was sinking, although I knew it. She was not only aware of all this, but even made inquiries about it indirectly. So that this now was something like the first hint on the subject, and my heart turned to her more warmly than ever. How is our patient? I asked. Oh, he is much better. He's up. And he went for a drive yesterday and again today. You don't mean to say you have not been to see him today. He's eagerly expecting you. I've behaved very badly to him. But now that you're looking after him and have quite taken my place, he is a gay deceiver and has thrown me over for you. A serious look came into her face, very possibly because my tone was rather too flippant. I have just been at Prince Sergei's, I muttered. And I... By the way, Lisa, you went to see Daria Anisimovna this morning, didn't you? Yes, she answered briefly without raising her head. But you do go to see the invalid every day, I believe, don't you? She asked suddenly, probably in order to say something. Yes, I go to see him, but I don't get there, I said laughing. I go in and turn to the left. Even the prince has noticed that you go to see Katerina Nikolaevna very often. He was speaking of it yesterday and laughing, said Anna Andreevna. What? What did he laugh at? He was joking. 
You know his way. He said that, on the contrary, the only impression that a young and beautiful woman makes on a young man of your age is one of anger and indignation. Anna Andreevna broke into sudden laughter. Listen, that was a very shrewd saying of his, I cried. Most likely it was not he said it, but you said it to him. Why so? No, it was he said it. Well, but suppose the beautiful lady takes notice of him, in spite of his being so insignificant, of his standing in the corner and fuming at the thought that he is only a boy. Suppose she suddenly prefers him to the whole crowd of admirers surrounding her. What then? I asked with a bold and defiant air. My head was throbbing. Then you are completely done for, laughed Lisa. Done for, I cried. No, I'm not done for. I believe that's false. If a woman stands across my path, she must follow me. I'm not going to be turned aside from my path with impunity. I remember Lisa once happened to mention long afterwards that I pronounced this phrase very strangely, earnestly, and as though reflecting deeply. And at the same time, it was so absurd, it was impossible to keep from laughing. Anna Andreevna did, in fact, laugh again. Laugh at me, laugh away, I cried in exultation, for I was delighted with the whole conversation and the tone of it. From you, it's a pleasure to me. I love your laugh, Anna Andreevna. It's a peculiarity of yours to keep perfectly quiet and then suddenly laugh all in one minute so that an instant before one could not guess what was coming from your face. I used to know a lady in Moscow. I used to sit in a corner and watch her from a distance. She was almost as handsome as you are, but she did not know how to laugh like you. Her face was as attractive as yours, but it lost all its attractiveness when she laughed. What's so particularly attractive in you is just that faculty. I have been meaning to tell you so for a long time. When I said of this Moscow lady that she was as handsome as you, I was not quite ingenuous. I pretended that the phrase had dropped from me unawares without my noticing it. I knew very well that such unconscious praise is more highly valued by a woman than the most polished compliment. And though Anna Andreevna might flush, I knew that it pleased her. And indeed, I invented the lady. I had known no such lady in Moscow. I had said so simply to compliment Anna Andreevna and give her pleasure. One really might imagine, she said with a charming laugh, that you had come under the influence of some fair lady during the last few days. I felt I was being carried away. I longed indeed to tell them something, but I refrained. By the way, only lately you spoke of Katerina Nikolaevna with very hostile feelings. If I did speak ill of her in any way, I cried with flashing eyes. What's to blame for it is the monstrous slander that she is an enemy of Andrei Petrovich's. There's a libelous story about him, too, that he was in love with her, made her an offer, and other absurdities of the sort. The notion is as grotesque as the other scandalous story, that during her husband's lifetime she promised Prince Sergei to marry him as soon as she would be a widow, and afterwards would not keep her word. But I have it firsthand that it was not so at all and that it was all only a joke. I know it firsthand. She did, in fact, when she was abroad, say to him in a playful moment, perhaps in the future. But what did that amount to beyond an idle word? I know very well that the prince on his side can attach no sort of consequence to such a promise, and indeed he has no intention of doing so, I added on second thoughts. I fancy he has very different ideas in his head, I put in slyly. Nastchokin said this morning at Prince Sergei's that Katerina Nikolaevna was to be married to Baron Boring. I assure you he received the news with the greatest equanimity. You can take my word for it. Has Nastchokin been at Prince Sergei's? Anna Andreevna asked with grave emphasis, apparently surprised. Oh yes, he seems to be one of those highly respectable people. And did Nastchokin speak to him of this match with Boring? asked Anna Andreevna, showing sudden interest. Not of the match, but of the possibility of one. He spoke of it as a rumor. He said there was such a rumor going the round of the drawing rooms. For my part, I am certain it's nonsense. Anna Andreevna pondered a moment and bent over her sewing. 
I love Prince Sergei, I added suddenly with warmth. He has his failings, no doubt. I have told you so already, especially a certain tendency to be obsessed by one idea. And indeed, his faults are a proof of the generosity of his heart, aren't they? But we almost had a quarrel with him today about an idea. It's his conviction that one must be honorable if one talks of what's honorable. If not, all that you say is a lie. Now, is that logical? Yet it shows the high standard of honesty, duty, and truth in his soul, doesn't it? Oh, good heavens, what time is it? I cried suddenly, happening to glance at the clock on the wall. Ten minutes to three, she responded tranquilly, looking at the clock. All the time I had talked to Prince Sergei, she listened to me with her eyes cast down with a rather sly but charming smile. She knew why I was praising him. Lisa listened with her head bent over her work. For some time past, she had taken no part in the conversation. I jumped up as though I were scalded. Are you late for some appointment? Yes. No. I am late, though. But I am just off. One word only, Anna Andreevna. I began with feeling. I can't help telling you today. I want to confess that I have often blessed your kindness and the delicacy with which you have invited me to see you. My acquaintance with you has made the strongest impression on me. In your room, I am, as it were, spiritually purified, and I leave you better than when I came. That's true. When I sit beside you, I am not only unable to speak of anything evil, I am incapable even of evil thoughts. They vanish away in your presence, and if I recall anything evil after seeing you, I feel ashamed of it at once. I am cast down and blush inwardly. And you know it pleased me particularly to find my sister with you today. It's a proof of your generosity, of such a fine attitude. In one word, you have shown something so sisterly, if I may be allowed to break the ice, to... As I spoke, she got up from her seat and turned more and more crimson. But suddenly she seemed in alarm at something, at the overstepping of some line which should not have been crossed, and she quickly interrupted me. I assure you I appreciate your feelings with all my heart. I have understood them without words for a long time past. She paused in confusion, pressing my hand. Lisa, unseen by her, suddenly pulled at my sleeve. I said goodbye and went out, but Lisa overtook me in the next room. Four. Lisa, why did you tug at my sleeve? I asked her. She is horrid, she is cunning, she is not worth it. She keeps hold of you to get something out of you, she murmured in a rapid, angry whisper. I had never before seen such a look on her face. For goodness sake, Lisa, she is such a delightful girl. Well, then I'm horrid. What's the matter with you? I am very nasty. She may be the most delightful girl, and I am nasty. That's enough. Let me alone. Listen, mother implores you about something of which she does not dare to speak. So she said, Arkady, darling, give up gambling, dear one. I entreat you, and so does mother. Lisa, I know, but I know that it's pitiful cowardice, but, but it's all of no consequence, really. You see, I've got into debt like a fool, and I want to win simply to pay it off. I can win, for till now I've been playing at random for the fun of the thing like a fool, but now I shall tremble over every ruble. It won't be me if I don't win. I have not got a passion for it. It's not important. It's simply a passing thing. I assure you I am too strong to be unable to stop when I like. I'll pay back the money and then I shall be altogether yours, and tell mother that I shall stay with you always. That three hundred rubles cost you something this morning. How do you know? I asked, startled. Darya Anisimovna heard it all this morning. But at that moment, Lisa pushed me behind the curtain, and we found ourselves in the so-called lantern, that is, a little circular room with windows all round it. Before I knew where we were, I caught the sound of a voice I knew, and the clang of spurs, and recognized a familiar footstep. Prince Sergei, I whispered. Yes, she whispered. Why are you so frightened? It's nothing. I don't want him to meet me. Tiens, you don't mean to say he's trying to flirt with you, I said, smiling. I'd give it to him if he did. Where are you going? Let us go. I will come with you. Have you said goodbye? Yes, my coat's in the hall. We went out. On the stairs, I was struck by an idea. Do you know, Lisa, he may have to come to make her an offer. N no, he won't make her an offer. 
she said firmly and deliberately in a low voice. You don't know, Lisa, though I quarreled with him this morning, since you've been told of it already, yet on my honor I really love him and wish him success. We made it up this morning. When we are happy, we are so good-natured. One sees in him many fine tendencies, and he has humane feelings, too, the rudiments, anyway. And in the hands of such a strong and clever girl as Anna Andreevna, he would rise to her level and be happy. I am sorry, I have no time to spare, but let us go a little way together. I should like to tell you something. No, you go on. I'm not going that way. Are you coming to dinner? I am coming. I am coming as I promised. Listen, Lisa, a low brute, a loathsome creature, in fact, called Stebokov, has a strange influence over his doings, an IOU. In short, he has him in his power, and he has pressed him so hard, and Prince Sergei has humiliated himself so far that neither of them see any way out of it except an offer to Anna Andreevna. And really, she ought to be warned, though that's nonsense. She will set it all to rights later. But what do you think? Will she refuse him? Goodbye. I am late, Lisa muttered. And in the momentary look on her face, I saw such hatred that I cried out in horror. Lisa, darling, what is it? I am not angry with you. Only don't gamble. Oh, you are talking of that. I'm not going to. You said just now, when we are happy. Are you very happy then? Awfully, Lisa, awfully. Good heavens. Why, it's past three o'clock. Goodbye, Lisa. Lizochka, darling, tell me, can one keep a woman waiting? Isn't it inexcusable? Waiting to meet you, do you mean? said Lisa, faintly smiling with a sort of lifeless, trembling smile. Give me your hand for luck. For luck? My hand? I won't. Not for anything. She walked away quickly, and she had exclaimed it so earnestly, I jumped into my sledge. Yes, yes, this was happiness, and it was the chief reason why I was as blind as a mole and had no eyes or understanding except for myself. End of part two, chapter three, read by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon.